from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Millicent Walker. Tonight, Air of Freedom for leader of the proscribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zaki and his wife Zenit, as court discharges and acquits them of alleged culpable homicide after five years. Supreme Court affirms the election of Rotimia Karedolu of the APC as validly elected governor of Ondo State in the 2020 poll, declares that PDP's case against his victory lacks merit. EFCC arrests former governor of Nasarawa State, Tanko Al-Makura, and his wife over alleged funds misappropriation during his tenure. And at least 14 people killed in flash floods triggered by heavy rains in India's northern Himachal Pradesh state. Plus business sports news from Abuja and later international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, total value of capital importation into Nigeria drops below $1 billion in the second quarter of this year. On sports news tonight, Nigeria's D Tigers search for their first win in the men's basketball event at the Tokyo Olympics continues following defeat to Germany. And from Abuja, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Matthew Kuka, urges civil society groups to ensure civil engagement in the civic space continues to sustain democracy in the country. Freedom at last for the leader of the proscribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zaki and his wife, as the Kaduna State High Court has discharged and acquitted them. They were accused of culpable homicide, disruption of public peace and unlawful assembly, among other charges, by the Kaduna State government. Justice Gideon Kurada upheld the no-case submission filed by El Zaki's counsel, Mr. Femi Falana, arguing that the witnesses presented by the prosecution counsel had been unable to establish any connection between the charges and the accused. The judgment was delivered about eight hours after the court commenced sitting on the matter. Counsel to both parties in the case have been reacting to the judgment. The court has indeed upheld our no case submission. The court found, and quite rightly, that the charges that were filed in the year 2018, portion to a penal law enacted by the Cardinal State Government in 2017 over offences that were allegedly committed in the year 2015 is an initial incompetence. The court ruled that the charge ought not to be in the first place. You cannot arraign a man for an offence that was allegedly committed as at the time the said crime was not an offence. And the court was very emphatic in that. That yes, the Cardinal State Government has powers to enact laws, but it cannot enact laws to prosecute an offence retrospectively. You cannot parade 15 witnesses, some of whom are people that are there on ground and are witnesses to the events of the 12th of December 2015, some of whom are soldiers, actors, those that acted there, came before the court, left their commands and came and gave evidence and said, this is what happened. This is what we saw. I gave order for this, uh, the defendant to be arrested. The defendant were arrested. They were brought to me. And I handed them over to the uh, uh, DSS for investigation. And you are saying the evidence he gave is nothing. It, it doesn't have any evidential value. So uh, we, the judge in his infidel wisdom has um, decided how he decided. We, uh, we, 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 it's the judicial system. We, are, we will respect the judicial system, we will respect his decision. But then the decision is not the final decision. The final decision rests to the appeal, appellate court. I will go to the appellate court and test it as soon as possible. 
We have more on the decision of the Kaduna State High Court on that case. In another legal victory, the Supreme Court upheld the candidacy of the Governor Rosimir Kaudulu of Ondo State in the October 10, 2020 governorship election. In a judgment of four justices against three, the Supreme Court held that the nomination of Governor Kaudulu by the All Progressives Congress, APC, cannot be nullified on the basis that his nomination form was signed by a sitting governor who is also the chairman of his political party. The candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, had approached the appeal court to nullify the candidacy of Mr. Akiridolu over the nomination process, which the PDP said was against the constitution. But the appeal court stuck out, uh, struck out the application for incompetence. It is Judgment Day here at the Supreme Court, where the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in the October 10, 2020 Ondo State Governorship election is challenging the candidacy of Mr. Rotimi Akiridolu, who was the candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC. An appeal court sitting in Akure, the Ondo state capital, had in June this year struck out the appeal by the PDP candidate for lack of competence, owing to the fact that Governor May Malabuni, who signed the nomination form of the APC candidate, was not listed in the suit. Counsel to all the parties in this case, including that of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, which is the first respondent, as well as supporters of the PDP and APC candidates, wait anxiously as Justice Mary Odili presides over a panel of seven judges to deliver their verdict. In a judgment of four justices against three, the Supreme Court upholds the judgment of the lower court, reaffirming the candidacy of Governor Akiridulu. You can see that it's a majority judgment, which means that the Supreme Court spoke in this majority. But a majority of four to three in a panel of seven is what I haven't seen in many, many years. But we, we, we believe the court has done what it's supposed to have done. Uh, the case is ended now. And, uh, and uh, my client, INEC, has been vindicated by this judgment. And um, all those who have also been vindicated, I congratulate them. I'm so excited and I'm happy with the judgment. Just, justice has been served and that's it. Although things did not turn out to be what he expected, the PDP-led council applauds the courage of the justices who gave the minority judgment. Now, with respect to the decision, the majority decision, all they said essentially was that my Malabuni ought to have been joined as a party. So the dissenting decisions uh, is essentially gave us the real interpretation that impunity should not be encouraged. I mean, we are building a nation. It's not about winner takes all. As it stands, the majority judgment of the Supreme Court is upheld, validating the victory of Governor Akiridolu in the October 10, 2020 Ondo State Governorship election. Meanwhile, the elated Governor Lua Rutimia Akiridolu has been reacting to the Supreme Court ruling, saying it's victory for the people of the state. He says he appreciates the panel of judges, the team of legal counsel and the leadership of the APC for their support during the legal tussle, promising to continue serving the people of the state to the best of his ability. We just uh, got the news of the final decision of the final court on the election petition filed by my brother, Eita Jengede Essien. Uh, as you all have heard, the Supreme Court dismissed his appeal on four to three basis. And, and that, in essence, is that from the tribunal up to the Supreme Court, the justices have affirmed that the petition was most frivolous. And that, as you know, 12 justices have found in their favor and only three supported that petition. 12 justices found in their favor. Three at the tribunal, five at the Court of Appeal, and four and the Supreme Court. So I have every reason 
to thank God and uh, appreciate our judiciary uh, for standing by the truth and for not yielding to any influence. And the president has congratulated Undo State Governor Rutimia Kaudulu over the Supreme Court judgment which upheld his re-election in the October 10th, 2020 governorship polls. In a statement from the special advisor to the president on media and publicity, Mr. Femi Adishino, President Muhammad Buhari, while extolling the virtues of Governor Kaudulu in providing effective governance to his people, urged him and all elected leaders of the governing party to always place the people first in their consideration of development programs and projects. President Buhari noted that the Supreme Court judgment preceded by that of the Court of Appeal further bolsters the strength and reach of the APC and its bright chances of consolidation in coming elections while calling on the opposition to work for the development of Ondo State. In reaction to the Supreme Court decision, the All Progressives Congress says it welcomes the verdict and rejoices with the government and the people of Undo State. In a statement from the National Secretary John Akpano Dehe, the APC insists that Governor Kodulu is poised to redouble his administration's efforts in providing quality service delivery and consolidating its giant strides in critical areas such as education, healthcare delivery and security while assuring residents of more people-oriented policies in the state. Meanwhile, the opposition People's Democratic Party, Ondo State Chapter, and its candidate in the October 2020 governorship election, Mr. Itayo Jagede, says they have also accepted the verdict of the Supreme Court being the apex court in the land. The Ondo State Publicity Secretary of the Party, Kennedy Perete, is, however, encouraging supporters to remain steadfast, insisting that the judgment of the Supreme Court will go down in history as one of the major tests of Nigeria's democracy, which ought to be guided by the rule of law. And back to our top story for this evening. Followers of the Islamic movement in Nigeria have for five years been in battle with the federal government over the detention of the group's leader, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zikziki, and his wife, Sinat. The tussle led to protests, which recorded a few fatalities. This next report gives a timeline of some of the high points of the saga. The case of Ibrahim El Zagzaki, founder of the Islamic Movement in Nigeria, or IMN, began in December 2015 after a clash between an army convoy and a procession of IMN faithful. El Zagzaki was detained and the legal tussle commenced. Trial commenced today and uh, two witnesses were taken. And so the trial will continue tomorrow. The two witnesses now. They are military they're... officers. They are military officers. No, they gave evidence about uh, the operation okay. uh, of the the op military operation that lasted between the twelfth and the fourteenth of December, twenty fifteen. Since his incarceration, it became a protracted battle between followers of the movement and security agencies. The matter boiled over into destruction of property and worse still, to the death of some. As the crisis heightened, El Zagzaki's health worsened, which led to calls for urgent medical attention. Another back and forth ensued to which the federal government eventually allowed El Zagzaki and his wife Zinat leave for India. There was confusion over issues of unfair treatment and tough restrictions by security operatives deployed to the medical facility, a rumor that was cleared by a member of the movement. We learned authoritatively from the Islamic Human Rights Commission, who are the organizers of this particular trip back for the Sheikh, that uh, the problem that the Sheikh encountered yesterday when he arrived in Delhi has been resolved. However, they returned after three days. Upon his return into the country, El Zagzaki was again detained, which led to protests at the United Nations office in Abuja. <laughs> Our 
as most of you are aware, and I'm sure you are all aware, the United Nations works with governments. So we will pass on your grievances to the government. So your response, uh, even though part of it will come from the United Nations, it will mostly come from the government of Nigeria. A high court in Kaduna on Monday, February 24th, 2020, ordered the Correctional Center to allow El Zagzaki and his wife full access to medical services before taking their plea on April 23rd of the same year. This high-profile case has been described as a witch hunt by some, while others say the detention is in the interest of security. The more important objective beyond how the issue is described should be how dialogue can produce tolerance to bring about peace. In part two after the break, Rahman Abbas, also known as Hush Puppy, pleads guilty to money laundering charges in the U.S. Plus, EFCC grills former governor of Nasarawa State, Tanko Almakura, and his wife over alleged funds misappropriation during his tenure. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Air of Freedom for the leader of the prescribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki and his wife, Zenit, has caught discharges and acquits them of alleged culpable homicide after five years. Supreme Court affirms the election of Rotimir Kredulu of the APC as the validly elected governor of Undo State in the 2020 poll, declares that PDP's case against his victory lacks merit. EFCC grills former governor of Nasarawa State, Tanko Makura, and his wife over alleged funds misappropriation during his tenure. And at least 14 people killed in flash floods triggered by heavy rains in India's northern Himachal Pradesh state. We continue with the judiciary and Abuja Magistrate Court has granted bail to five Buhari Mosco protesters who were arrested at Junamis International Gospel Centre in Abuja on the 4th of July 2021. They were arraigned on a five-count charge bordering on disturbance of public peace and offence the counsel to the SSS says is contrary to section 96 of the Penal Code Law. The trial magistrate, Mohamed Zubairu, admitted them to bail in the sum of 500,000 naira each, an surety in like sum. They are also to submit their passport photographs, show reliable means of livelihood and identification of their sureties. The judge held that he was admitting them to bail as the five-count charge slammed on them by the SSS was a bailable one and the service had no objection to their release. The suit had been adjourned to August 23rd uh, for trial. Ben Manista, Anene Udoka, Henry Mwodo, Samuel Larry and Samuel Gabriel were arrested for wearing T-shirts with the inscription, Buhari must go. An alleged international fraudster, Raymond Abbas, who is popularly known as Hush Puppy, has agreed to plead guilty to charges including money laundering, wire fraud, felony, amongst others, as brought against him by the United States District Court for the Central District of California. In a plea agreement document, Hush Puppy agreed to plead guilty as charged. The document was signed by Hush Puppy, his lawyer, Lawyer Shapiro, acting United States Attorney Tracy Wilkerson, amongst others. It stated that Raymond Abbas risked 20 years imprisonment, a three-year period of supervised release, a fine of $500,000 or twice the gross gain or gross loss resulting from the offence. The document partly read defendant. Hush Puppy admits that defendant is in fact guilty of the offence to which defendant is agreeing to plead guilty. To other stories, President Mohamed Abari has pledged to increase the budget for education. And this is by as much as 50% over the next two years. In a signed document titled Heads of State Court to Action on Education Financing Ahead of the Global Education Summit in London, the United Kingdom, the President stated, we commit to progressively increase our annual domestic education expenditure by 50% over the next two years and up to 100% by 2025 beyond the 20% global benchmark. The Global Education 
Nations Summit seeks to give opportunity for leaders to make five-year pledges to support GPE's work to help transform education systems in up to 90 countries and territories. The former governor of Nasarawa State, Tanko Amakura, has been interrogated by the headquarters of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, in Abuja. It was gathered the serving senator and his wife were questioned in relation to an alleged breach of trust and misappropriation of funds allegedly perpetrated during Mr. Amakura's eight-year tenure as governor of Nasarawa State. Mr. Almakura served as governor of the state between 2011 and 2019 before he was elected into the National Assembly as senator representing Nasarawa South Senatorial District. The former governor, however, is said to have returned to his home after the questioning. He was not arrested, but we understand only invited by the DSS. U.S. lawmakers have stopped a proposed sale of attack helicopters to Nigeria. This comes after growing concerns about the country's human rights record. Senior Democrats and Republicans at the U.S. Senate's Foreign Relations Committee delayed clearing a proposed sale of 12 AH-1 Cobra attack helicopters and accompanying defense systems to the Nigerian military in a deal worth some $875 million dollars. This development brings to the fore concerns among Washington policymakers about how the country is able to handle the delicate balance between national security objectives and protection of human rights. Experts say the move by the U.S. Senate is likely to make the Biden administration reconsider America's relations with Nigeria, even as it grapples with security challenges. And to security matters now, the Chief of Army Staff has called on the public to always provide these two security agencies in the country with actionable intelligence that will help apprehend criminals and reduce criminality. He said this during a visit to the governor of Bielsa State at Government House, Yenagra, while on an operational tour of the state. Meanwhile, Governor of Bielsa State, Doya Deary, hopes the country will overcome the spate of insecurity in the country and soon. What the security agencies services require from good citizens is actionable intelligence and information. We are just talking with the Excellency over matters and I mentioned that the criminals among us, they are not from heaven. They are with us. So if we cooperate and we see them in their light, we will deal with them. Historically, by statistics, in a society, those who are criminals are less than 10% ordinarily. In fact, they are 5% by some estimates. But they are the ones all this havoc. Because one person with a gun can go to the market and shoot and now, you know, cause a lot of havoc. That one person is not from heaven, it's from within us. So if we who stay with them uh, share this information, we can catch him before he shoots his gun and kill somebody. Very many good citizens here are doing that, and it's with that, among other support, that we are achieving what we are achieving. And I request Your Excellency and the good people of Belsa to please continue to support us in that regard. We work as one, as a people who, whose development has been stunted and now looking forward for a fast race to take our country to better heights. And therefore, the intractable security challenges that we have all across our country we believe that with your coming, God who has brought you in will also give you the wherewithal and the support to bring the level of insecurity we have witnessed for some time down to the point that Nigeria will actually stand up as the giant of Africa. 
And to a river state where the executive council has approved a bill to prohibit open grazing of cattle in the state ahead of its transmission to the state's legislature. The move comes after 17 southern governors agreed to ban open rearing and grazing of cattle in the region as a measure to stem the alarming rate of herders' farmers' clashes in the region. The Commissioner for Justice and Attorney General of the state, Professor Zakius Andango, says the memo for the enactment of the bill was considered having re Realize that the state does not have extant laws to affect the decision of these southern governors. Ms. Adango added that the bill will not only criminalize open grazing, but also legitimize the establishment of livestock ranch administration and control committees. If you look at that bill, it's divided into four parts. The first part of that bill, this with the objectives of the bill, that's what the bill intends to achieve and then also deals with establishment of the state and local government livestock and ranch administration and control committees. The second part of the bill deals with establishment of ranches and issuance of ranching permits. Third part deals with prohibition of open rearing and grazing of livestock offenses and penalties therefore. The final part of the bill deals with miscellaneous provisions, including power to arrest, detain, and pound trespassing livestock and the jurisdiction of the court to try offenses. Now, in summary, once that bill is passed, no person will be allowed to openly graze livestock in the vessel, except within the confines of a ranch. And to establish a ranch, you must apply to the state committee for approval. And that committee, having regard to the guidelines it's going to issue, may or may not issue approval to establish a ranch. So any person who, after the passage of this bill into law, openly grazes cattle in River State, will find himself within the warm embrace of the law. When the news at 10 returns, total value of capital importation into Nigeria drops by 54% in the second quarter of this year. That's on Business News. Do join us again. And we're off to Abuja, where Mark Bogun Yusuf has some more stories. Hello, Mark Breh. Hello, Millicent. We begin right here in the capital territory. The Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Bishop Matthew Koka, is urging civil society organizations to strengthen the nerves of Nigerians and ensure continued engagement in the civic space. The cleric wants the civil society groups to remember that they were responsible for returning Nigeria to democratic rule pointing out that bad governance is the enemy of the Nigerian people. Bishop Kuka was speaking virtually at the Civic Space Roundtable discussion in Abuja. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. The importance of the civic space to social cohesion and integration is at the core of discussions at this civil society engagement. For many Nigerians, engaging with the government is a far-fetched concept. We want a civic space engagement that supports the intellectual component of governance and ensures that government policy formulation is done on the basis of evidence and not sentiments. Policies to stifle the civic space should not deter civil society organizations from doing their duty, according to Bishop Kuka. Rather than accusing some of us of of rebellion. It is bad governance that is a rebellion because really when people sought to be elected, it was to make a better life for our people. Tragically, uh, that has not been the case, but I believe we can turn the corner. The civic space is the pathway to social cohesion and integration. Questions on whether it is being shrunk produce different answers. However, the panel points out some of the reasons for the perceived docile nature of Nigeria's civil space. What has brought us thus far from the military regime is civil society. And rather than get ourselves into self-defeatism by saying, oh, we are shrinking. No, we have to keep knocking at the door. We have to keep remaining strident, remaining active. I think one of our problems uh, sometimes, even when we are given the space, is our unwillingness to take the space or lack of confidence to take the place or the integrity of the individual that will take the space. You find most of the media group, they have either a political leaning or an ethnic leaning. And this leaning is what they put across when they have 
they are in their TV station, even by the kind of analysts that they bring into the country. The civic space is not a physical construct. It's given by nature and resides in man. And that's the reason why no matter how long an injustice lasts for, man will find his voice. Speakers at this event believe that there is a government-backed tension in the Nigerian public. People are scared of being labeled as rebellious. Well, like Bishop Kuka said earlier, it is bad governance that should be regarded as a rebellion against Nigerian people and not pointing out the failures of government. Kayla Magua, Channel Television News. Now, five prospective corps members have lost their lives in a car accident on the Abaji Kwali Highway in Abuja. According to a statement issued by the Director of Press and Public Relations at the National Youth Service Corps, Mrs. Adeniki Adeyemi, the incident happened in the early hours of today. The management of the Corps has commiserated with the government and the people of Imo and Akwaibom states where the deceased persons are from. And the Director General of the Corps, Brigadier General Shraibo Ibrahim, has prayed that the families and, and loved ones of the deceased will be granted the fortitude to bear the loss. And in health matters, the Governor of Kano State says health care is a priority in the administration and providing quality health care delivery to the people of Kano at the grassroots takes precedence. Governor Abdullahi Gandujay stated this at the Health Annual Summit aimed towards the attainment of universal health coverage through full implementation of minimum service package. The event, which brought together all stakeholders and health workers in the state, was to develop policy documents and encourage individuals to contribute their quota to the health sector. The state government is committed to invest the resources to improve primary health care infrastructure such as health facility upgrade, procuring and distributing base primary health care equipment, and the employment of additional skilled personnel. We are also committed to improve primary health care funding, especially at the local government level. We will continue to train our health care providers in line with global best practices to continue to provide an integrated, high-quality primary health care system. Kano State Government has consistently allocated more than 15% of this annual budget to health, which is above the 2001 Abuja Declaration. Our ability to collaborate with the partners and several stakeholders with mutual accountability and demonstrable result is exemplified by our strong partnership with the Ali Kotangbati Foundations, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, World Bank, United States Agency for International Development, among other donors and partners. And that's all from Abuja. It's back now to you, Millicent. Thanks, Mark Breath. Now to some company news. The mutual desire of First Bank Nigeria PLC and the Lagos State Government to see economic growth and development has culminated in a partnership to build a primary health care centre in Iba Loku development area. Officials of the Lagos State Government, First Bank and traditional rulers participated in the groundbreaking ceremony to mark the start of the building project. Hard to reach would be an apt description of Ije Ododo community in Iba local government area of Lagos State. With its rough, irregular and untarred roads, the going is difficult. That's why it's with great anticipation of development that members of the community witnessed the groundbreaking ceremony for what would be the first Lagos State primary healthcare prototype in Ije Ududu. Profitability is important to us, but community service, being part of the society, seen to the overall growth of the economy and development of our people, is also very important. We also came with um, Loma because of the, if you look at coming along the road, it's like dump site, you know, everywhere. So to keep that environment, I mean, make it a model one that we can now replicate and go to another community. 
The Commissioner for Health is expecting that once in use, the facility will be an experience in top quality infrastructure and service. We've come together with the Primary Healthcare Board to design something that is internationally accepted, reduces your risk, makes your life experience at that facility a good one. We also have to think about the medical personnel, that they are also comfortable. You know, we're trying to encourage our doctors and our nurses to stay in Nigeria. Residents are happy and encourage the Lagos First Bank partnership and others to bring more development. Actually, the nearest health center should be one hour, 30 minutes drive from this community. There is land for any foreseeable development. While the First Bank Group CEO is sure there will be other projects to collaborate on, the Lagos State Government is also set to fix the approximately 19-kilometer road linking Ijegun area of Lagos and build a community recreation center. And now to some business news, here's Melinda Kilami. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Hey, thanks, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. The total value of capital importation into Nigeria dipped by 54.06% to $875.62 million in the second quarter of this year, compared to the $1.91 billion recorded in the first quarter. According to the latest report released by the National Bureau of Statistics, the largest amount of foreign investment by type was received through portfolio investment, which accounted for 62.97% of total capital importation. Lagos State emerged as the top destination of capital investment in the second quarter with $780.06 million, while the United Kingdom emerged as the top source of capital investment in Nigeria with $310.26 million within the period. The Lagos State government is looking at the 2021 budget performance, which stood at 81% at the end of June this year. This is coming from the Commissioner I'm for Economic Planning and Budget, Mr. So, sir, Sam Ibuwe. He sir. made this well, known well, as the Budget Consultative Forum to discuss the budget policy for achieving the short, medium and long-term development plan for the state. Our oil palm production has been described as a massive economic activity with a capacity for job creation, revenue generation and community development. This assertion was made by the Manager Director and CEO of Presco PLC, Mr. Felix Wabuko, in an interview with Channels Television during the 28th Annual General Meeting for the year ended 2020. It is the 28th annual general meeting of Presco PLC, Obayati, Bobanga local government area of Edo State. The chairman of the company, Paul Cadion, joins the meeting virtually from where he presides over proceedings. And now, laying the annual report and the class. Some shareholders are physically present with others sending their proxies. During the voting session, Mr. J.B. Herrero is re-elected as a director of the company. Right, chairman, it's been moved and seconded. Followed by other positions, including the board of the audit okay, committee. So we have a total of 928 each for each of them. Dividends of 200 copper per share mounting to 2 billion naira is approved for the shareholders. The account is solid, very, very fine. All the indices are wonderful, all looking up. And then, of course, you gave us 200 naira, which is 2 naira. Uh, 200 kobo, which is about 2 naira a share as dividend. This shareholder is delighted that business is good for the investors in spite of the economic challenges in the country, while also applauding the employment policy adopted by Presco PLC. Because of the way Nigeria is going, we've been experiencing financial pagmaya, economic pagmaya in the country. But Presco, they employed 50 disabled people in, in the company. That makes them one of the listening companies in Nigeria. I invested million in this company, and I'm happy I'm recruiting the investment which I did. 
The managing director and CEO of Presco speaks glowingly of the huge economic capacity of palm production to the economy of the country. When you develop oil palm, you are releasing a lot of raw materials to industries. It cuts across a lot of industries. Now, in terms of employment generation, it's one, one area of agricultural endeavor where you take a lot of people off the streets. We have um, an average 7,000, 8,000 workers employed. Um, we have a sister company in River State that employs on average 5,000, 6,000. That's already 13,000. Profit for the year ended as at December 31st, 2020, stands at 5,261,929 naira. It's the second day of negative close on the NGX as total volume of transactions drops by 2.3% amid a mixed performance and mild loss in total market value. Indy John Mekwa has the summary of today's trading numbers. and welcome to the stock market report. A further drop in the activity level at the Nigerian Exchange Group has maintained the bare dominance at the end of trading today. Well, the all share index declined again, the very marginal today, at 38,791.03 points. Top advances were Capital Hotel PLC, O&O, and BOC Gas. The banking sector did not do so well today. Its index declined 0.96%. Consumer was up 0.11%, but the biggest gainer today was oil and gas once again. It was up 1.68%. For the third consecutive session, O&O is top trades with over 44 million units of its shares worth about 233 million naira traded and its share price added 47 cobble to close at 5 naira 26 cobble at the close of trading 6 billion naira was lost from the total market value we had 18 gainers and 24 losers leaving a negative market breath at the close of today's session that's the stock market report i'm ini john mekwa And thanks, Ini. Let's check out the numbers outside our shores. Major equities market across Africa, United States, Europe and Asia ended the day with mixed sentiments as investors react to impressive results from tech giants and the first... So easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Melinda. And no fewer than 14 people have been killed in flash floods triggered by heavy rains in India's northern Himachal Pradesh state. Floods caused by cloudbursts in the Kulu district of the state left a trail of destruction as water from Braham Ganga, a tributary of the Parvati River, entered residential areas, killing people, damaging houses and property. Simon Pusey has more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The second day of the first full congressional inquiry into the attack on the US Capitol building has begun in the US House of Representatives. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. It's after four police officers delivered testimony on their struggle to defend the US Capitol on January the 6th against a mob of Donald Trump's supporters. That prompted a torrent of racial epithets. The officers described how they were beaten, taunted with racial insults and faced threats of being killed with their own guns. The panel heard the most detailed public account to date of what law enforcement officers faced, with several officers holding back tears as they testified. North and South Korea are in talks to reopen a joint liaison office that Pyongyang demolished last year and hold a summit. That's according to sources in the South Korean government. The sources say no time frame or other details for the summit have been raised due to the coronavirus pandemic. 
The two Koreas are technically still at war after their 1950-1953 conflict ended in a ceasefire, but on Tuesday they restored hotlines the North had severed in June last year. Attacks by the Taliban on civilians as U.S. troops pull out of Afghanistan are deeply troubling. That's according to the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. In New Delhi, for talks with Indian leaders, Blinken said the only path to peace in Afghanistan was through negotiations, which all parties must take seriously. Taliban insurgents have swept through districts across the country and seized vital border control points in recent weeks, as Washington has withdrawn its last troops after 20 years. Uh, we've also seen these reports of atrocities committed by the Taliban in areas that it's, uh, that it's taken over uh, that are um, deeply, uh, deeply troubling. Uh, and certainly do not uh, uh, speak well to the Taliban's intentions for, uh, for the country uh, as a whole. The African Union has joined the European Union and the U.S. in calling for dialogue and calm in Tunisia after the president suspended parliament and sacked government officials. The union urged Tunisia to respect its constitution and reject violence. In a phone conversation between the AU Commission chairperson Moussa Faki Mahmat and Tunisia's foreign minister, a spokesperson of the European Commission as well urged all actors to respect Tunisia's constitution and called for calm. Turkey has ramped up security measures in the eastern province of Van amid concerns over a potential new influx of migrants to the country from Afghanistan passing via Iran. A modular concrete wall is being built on Turkey's 295 kilometer long border with Iran. That's according to the regional governor. Turkish Interior Ministry officials said they detained more than 1,600 migrants in the past three weeks in the province of Van. Meanwhile, a massive fire has erupted in two different locations in southern Turkey. Antalya's Manavat district has destroyed dozens of hectares of forest cover and caused the evacuation of five settlements. The cause of the fires, which are rapidly spreading due to strong winds, are still unknown. 19 helicopters and 103 fire trucks have been sent to the region. People living in Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh are dealing with the aftermath of the huge flooding that swept through the southern region of the country on Tuesday. At least six Rohingya Muslims, including children, were killed and several others injured after heavy monsoon rains triggered landslides and flooding in several refugee camps in southern Bangladesh. Nearly one million Rohingya live in crowded camps in the border districts after fleeing a military crackdown in neighboring Myanmar in 2017. Petrol bombs have been thrown at the Cuban embassy in the French capital Paris. Cuba's foreign ministry released surveillance footage of the attack showing Molotov cocktails landing inside the gated compound on Monday night. Three petrol bombs were thrown by two unarmed individuals. France's foreign ministry has condemned the attack and says it's investigating who was responsible. And finally, a 19-year-old is aiming to set the record for the youngest woman to fly solo around the world next month. Belgian Zara Rutherford sets off on her 32,000-mile journey in her bespoke Shark Ultralight plane, the world's fastest microlight, on August the 11th. Once completed, Miss Rutherford will be the youngest person to fly a microlight around the world and the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. She says she hopes her trip will inspire other girls to follow in her footsteps. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Main thanks, Simon. And just in news just in, the traditional ruler of Jabba chiefdom in Kaduna State, Geert Made, has been freed. The 83 monarch, who was kidnapped on Monday by gunmen suspected to be kidnappers, was released this evening after spending about two days with his abductors. A relative of the traditional council, Anthony Made, told Channel Television that the ruler returned to his palace this evening. Coming up on Sports News, Team Nigeria competed in two events earlier today at the ongoing Tokyo Olympic Games. Reigning African basketball champions, the Tigers were denied their first Olympic victory in the men's basketball event after losing by seven points to Germany in the second round of matches in Group B. The senior men's basketball team needed a victory to put them in a good position to seal qualification to the quarterfinals, but lost 92 to 99 points to the Germans. Elsewhere, Nigeria's sole swimmer at the Games, Abiola Ogubawa, claimed victory in Heat 1 of the women's 100 meters freestyle. 
Are the first Olympic gold medalists in the 3x3 basketball were crowned in Tokyo earlier today, with the US victorious in the women's division and Latvia taking the men's top honors, both coming with wins over Russian teams. The US team stacked with WNBA talent defeated the Russian Olympic Committee ROC 18-15. Latvia beat the men of the Russian Olympic Committee ROC 21-18. And at the end of the sporting activities for today, hosts Japan stay top of the medal table with 13 gold, 4 silver and 5 bronze medals, while the People's Republic of China have moved up to the second spot, displacing the US. China have picked a total of 27 medals, and this includes 12 gold, 6 silver and 9 bronze. The US are in third with 11 gold, 11 silver and 9 bronze. That sports news is back to you, Millicent. Thank you, Arutunde. And the main news again. The leader of the proscribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zekzeki, and his wife Zina today breathed the air of freedom as the Kaduna State High Court discharged and acquitted them of alleged culpable homicide after five years in detention. That's News at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. Millicent Walker, stay safe.